What we're going to do tonight before we launch into Genesis 6 is actually look at the lead up. Um, I was doing the milk round one day, this was years ago, and um, I, I've never been very good with theological words, can't say half of them. And, and, the, and the word just popped into me mind, antediluvian. I thought, what on earth does that mean, antediluvian? Just popped into my mind like that, antediluvian. I thought, what does that mean? Anyway, got home, Googled it. It means before the flood, before the flood. So that's what we're going to look at because you can't really understand Noah and his family unless you look at the two genealogies that lead to it and then we'll have a look at that and we'll... we'll come to an end on that part of it tonight but if somebody wants to read uh, first of all Genesis 4 1 to 7 Genesis 4 1 to 7 <coughs> now Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bore Cain and said I have acquired a man from the Lord then she bore again this time his brother Abel now Abel was a keeper of sheep But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Go on, mate. <clears throat> and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also bought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. <laughs> then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your oh, brother? That'll do, that'll do, Kevin, that's fine. Is that your phone? That's what I'm to get to the door. Okay. Jane. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me just make this point, right? It's chaos, isn't it? <laughs> Thing is, we're supposed to start at half past, but then, you know, there's still people coming. Okay, so, does everybody... I, I, I think some people don't realise that there are two lines that come from Adam that we see that lead to the flood. Right, so there's the line of Cain. Remember, Abel was murdered. We've just read that if you can follow it. Abel's murdered. God says to Cain, Here, look, Cain, you can do the right thing, it's in your power to do the right thing, and you need to do the right thing. And of course, he doesn't do the right thing, and he goes on and he kills his brother, and so on. So, when we look at Cain's line. It's very obvious that it's a, it's a, they're a bad bunch. You know, they go off, they build cities, they keep cattle, they're nomads, they're musicians. You see that they're arrogant, they're violent, they're murderers, they're sexually immoral. And then all of a sudden, the line stops. The line of Cain stops. And there's also, which is quite bizarre, it doesn't say how old they were. It's really weird with, with Cain's line. But there are two lines. There's Cain's line and there's Seth's line. And Cain's line falls away from God very, very quickly. Very quickly. Seth's line falls at a much slower rate, but it still falls. They both fall. One falls really quickly and they get violent very quickly. But the other one, Seth's line, takes time. And it sort of reminds me of what happens um, after Solomon, where you've got the kingdom north, you've got the kingdom south. The ten tribes up the north fall away very quickly, don't they? Yeah. But the two tribes down south, they do fall away, but not quite at the mm -hmm. same rate. It's very like that. So if you go to Genesis chapter 4 and just uh, somebody read 25 to 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Yeah. 
next and, and as for Seth, <clears throat> to him also a son was born, <coughs> and he named him Enosh. That then men began to call on the name of the Lord. It's really interesting. So Seth's line was the better line. Obviously, it's a godly line. Seth means appointed. We see that there. God has appointed me. That's what Seth means. The reason why they call upon the name of the Lord in the days of Enosh, Enosh means mortal. And there's a sense in which they began to realize their mortality. And that's what tends to happen to people. You know, people can go through the life. But when they become aware of their mortality, for instance, if you were a young man, um, uh, I don't know, let's say 1938 or something like that, and you're walking around London and you're just enjoying life, but then a few, few years later, you're on a landing craft going to the beaches of Normandy, mm. yeah. when are you likely to call <laughs> upon the Lord? Yeah. Mm. When you realise that you're mortal. And the chances are you're going to draw your last breath very, very quickly. So people do call on the Lord when they realize them. We all do. We're all the same. We're all the same. So there's this moment of clarity. And thank God for our mortality. Because if we were immortal, I don't think we ever would. I think we'd go and do our own thing. But it's that mortality that gives us the clarity to call out to God. So what we have here is we have this, this line. Now I know this is an old teaching, most people know it, but there's 10 generations here and Adam <coughs> means man, Seth means appointed, Enosh means mortal, Kenan means sorrow, Mahalel El means the blessed one or the blessed Lord or the blessed God, Yared means to come down or descend, Enoch means teaching, Methuselah means his death shall bring, Lamech means despairing, and Noah means comfort. So when you put all of these names together, it does seem to bear out something of the gospel message. That man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring the despairing comfort. Yeah. Noah meaning comfort. Very interesting. Now... Within this genealogy, if you look at verse 16, it says, Then Mahalalel lived 830 years after he became the father of Yared. And he had other sons and daughters. So Mahal the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. And Yared lived 100 and... How many years? I've got 62. 62 and he became the father of Enoch. Now... Yared means descent, descent, to come down. Yeah. And this is where they, they believe the Nephilim came at this point, this point of the descent. The Nephilim were there before the days of Noah. This, uh, what we see in the days of Noah is the culmination of wickedness upon the earth, yes. you see. So you get the summary. But at this point under Yared... Going down, descent, they say this is, in Jewish tradition as well, they believe that this is when they came. Now, interestingly, during these days was Enoch. Now, Enoch, there's two, there's two main characters here that really stand out. One of them is Enoch and one of them is Noah. Both of them were preachers and both, both of them walked with the Lord. Both were preachers, both walked with the Lord. Enoch means teaching. And so all the days of Yared were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years and he became the father of Methuselah. Methuselah means his death shall bring. And it seems that Enoch was given a prophecy. And the prophecy was when Methuselah dies, the flood's going to come. We know this because of, as we'll see in a minute, we know this because of Enoch's preaching. Enoch absolutely knew something terrible was coming, as we'll see. So Enoch, as soon as he realizes this, he starts to walk with the Lord. Then Enoch walked with God for 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. See that? After he became the father of Methuselah, Methuselah means his death shall bring. So he begins to walk with the Lord. So these are really difficult days. Well, how do we know this? Well, have a look at Jude. 
Jude 14, I think. Jude 14 and 15. Somebody got that? <coughs> it was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. It's amazing, isn't it? It's so, there's two things that really stick out in that sermon. All, 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 and ungodly, 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 ungodly. Well, that's, this is Jude, don't forget. This is Jude. But actually what you read in Genesis 6 is exactly that. All, 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 and ungodly, 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 ungodly. It fits like a glove. So if we go back to Genesis again, we've seen the two lines. So even the good line, even the more righteous line fell, really fell. So when we get to the days of Noah, the world is a mess. And there's only, there's only ever a remnant. You know, if you look at what James said, he said, there's only ever been a remnant. God reserves a remnant throughout history. So when we get to um, Genesis 6, we, this is the context. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. There was a, there was a huge population explosion. That daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit, which is what we've been looking at, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. Remember, we looked at the restrainer last week. Yeah. Yeah. Shall not strive with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. In other words, in 120 years time, the flood is coming. And when, when Methuselah died, his death shall bring, the flood came. It's incredible. Now, I, I, I mentioned this um, probably about a year ago, I think. But I do see in this um, something that's happening today. And that is that godly people, the Lord is taking godly people. And they are going. And... Um, you know, you could say that about any age. Yes, you could. But look at what we've just heard before the meeting. That Scotland has just passed a law, a really ambiguous law, that says that if they deem anything that you say to be a hate crime, you can end up in prison for seven years. What kind of world are we living in? It's insane. It's insane. And the Lord is taking people... I know nobody wants to die. I get that. I don't want to die. No one wants to die. But at the same time, he seems to be taking quality people. And we are worse for it. And, and heaven is better for it. Now, then it says, now the Nephilim were there in those days. So effectively, what you've got is transhumanism. And it's something else that, of course, <coughs> they're really ramping up right now. Transhumanism. The Nephilim were there in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those who were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Verse 5, it says, Now the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Can you see how wholesale this is? It's just as in Jude, all, 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 ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. Yeah. It says here that, they, they, that the Lord sees the wickedness that's on the earth and every intent and the thoughts of his heart was only evil <coughs> continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he, he was grieved in his heart. Yeah. Now this tells us something. And this is really important. And it, it, it tells us that we don't serve a God that is numb 
and, and disconnected from us that what we do grieves him. And that he hasn't just put everything in play and, you know, everybody's just a pawn on, in a chess game that's been moved around by God for his own good pleasure. Mm -hmm. But that God is actually grieved yeah. by the things that go on and he regrets making them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Paul, Paul says in one of his letters, have I got to, have I got to labour over you? all over again it's a pastoral thing he's grieving over the church have i got to labor over you all over again and you see the heart of god here and we mustn't go by and think oh you know well no god look our God is not like the God of Islam that's distant and impersonal. No. That is not the God that we serve. No. He, he wants relationship with these people. He was a friend. Noah, um, Abraham was a friend of God. Enoch walked with God. Noah walked with God. We can have a relationship with God. We can dialogue with God. Shall not the God of the whole earth do what's right? Dialogue stands in the gap for God. Moses stands in the gap for God and says, Lord, what are you doing? What are you thinking of doing here? What will your enemies think about you? This is the God that we serve. He's amazing. He's what sets him apart from everybody else. But we sometimes we, we move over these things and we don't think it through. Now have a look at Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel 38, 31. Sorry, Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 18, verse 31 and 32. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make ye a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye here. Can you see this, folks? <laughs> Or is it just me? Am, am I going nuts? People are not on automatic pilot. They have a choice to make yeah, in this yeah. life. They have a choice to make in this life. And he says, shall you die? I have no pleasure in the wicked. God, well, for one thing, it tells us that, that, that hell was not made for people. It was made for Satan and his angels. But the idea that hell was made for people to fry for God's good pleasure is simply not biblical. No. It is not what no. the Bible teaches. God teaches that yes, he's sovereign, but that sovereignty never overrides free will. And I want you to think about it. Please think about this. Tell me one time when any tyrant that ruled the world why do they always take away free will? Why do tyrants always take away free will? They always do, because that's what tyrants do. They take away free will. When Corrie ten Boom was offered a cup of tea in hospital for the first time, she was shocked because for an entire year, what the Nazis do is they take away free will. That's what's coming in the future. Yeah. That is the future. Slavery. Yeah. They want to enslave people and make sure they have no choice. That choice is gone. But it says here, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That he actually regrets making them. This is not some sovereign law that is bulldozing over everybody's thoughts and feelings. No. He is so secure in himself that he allows people their free will. This is the gospel. There is sovereignty, but there is also free will. And what we see in Noah, and we're going to see, it, is one of the most tremendous pictures of the gospel in the entire Bible. And he, he was sorry that he made man. Sorry. And the Lord was sorry that he, and, and it says, and the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things, to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. 
And then we read three things that Noah was doing. These are the records or the generations or genealogy. It's the same word, generations, mm. genealogy. Remember what had happened. The, the, the gene pools had been completely perverted. Yes. We see a similar thing, by the way, in the days of Canaan. Yes. And it says there were Nephilim also in those days. Yes. Why do you think God said to uh, Joshua, wipe them out? Yes. Wipe them out because something similar happened in the time of Canaan. Yes. What we see here is something had entered in. Now, all we can surmise in this is that Noah and his family, which most certainly represent a remnant, this remnant, had stood against this stuff that was coming in. They wouldn't accept it. So you've got women that are copulating with angels. You've got Nephilim that are copulating with women. And there's all kinds of hybrid things being born and birthed at that time. Yeah. But Noah and his family it says Noah was a righteous man, he was blameless in his time, and that Noah walked with God. There's three things there. And it's repeated again in, in, in Genesis chapter 7. So that's what we know about them. Now, was he righteous like Jesus? No, no man was righteous like Jesus. No man. Even Job wasn't righteous like Jesus. But in terms of what was going on at that time, here was a man that Peter said was a herald, a preacher, a herald of righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness that was walking with God at that time, that was not contaminated by this, yeah. and there was eight of them. And you, th you think, it just eight? Is that it? Yeah. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, make every effort to enter by the narrow way. Yes. For broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are on it. But narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and there are few that find it. He even tells us there's few. But he says, you make every effort that you get on that narrow way. And so you see this remnant. And then it, we, we were introduced, Noah, to the three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and obviously their wives were not polluted and Noah's wife was not polluted. That's yeah. obvious. Yeah. But then it says, let's go, let somebody want to read from verse 11 through to 14. <clears throat> now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside okay. and out. Brilliant. Thanks, Alan. Now then, it's, if you want to go to Leviticus chapter 4, Leviticus 4.20, You'd have to just do a word study for yourself on this. This word, it comes up, it's littered in the Torah. It's littered everywhere in the Torah, this word for pitch. It's everywhere. But here's a good example of it. Uh, Leviticus 4.20. <clears throat> Somebody got that? And he shall do with the bull as he did with the bull as a sin offering. <laughs> Thus he shall do with it. So the priest shall make atonement for them and it shall be forgiven them. That's what the word pitch is. It's the word atonement. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that so you sh look, there's a type here. And I hope you can see this type because you're going to see it in the New Testament. His name is Jesus. <laughs> so this yeah. ark is both in and out, is covered in atonement. Yes. Atonement, that's the word. And look at what it says. And then he shall be forgiven. Yes. Because it's the blood. The life is in the blood and it's given for, for the forgiveness of our yes. sins, you see. Okay, so then you've got a verse 15. We looked at this the other week. Somebody want to read that? 
and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Hold on, sorry, back, at, back in, sorry, that's my fault. Back in Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse 15, if you want to go to, from 15 all the way through to 20, well, well, I'll read 15 and then we'll, we'll, we'll do the rest of it. So this is how you will make it. Its length will be 300 cubits, its width shall be 50, and its height will be 30. We looked at those measurements. 300 is a picture of Gideon's army, a remnant that's whittled down to the, the absolute bare minimum. Remember, they were told to smash their clay vessels and let the light leak out, and the enemy got confused at that. And the enemy always gets confused at brokenness. The enemy doesn't even understand the alphabet of the Holy Spirit breaking through broken bodies. Totally confuses the enemy. Yeah. 350, which is the number of the Holy Spirit, and 30, which is the number of maturity. You put these numbers together, you get a picture of the remnant in the last days. The remnant, 300, they're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and they're going to be mature. We have to be mature. Okay, if somebody wants to read verse 16 to 22. You shall make an, uh, a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second and third decks. Behold, <clears throat> I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing on the ground after its kind, mm. two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Mm. Therefore, 22. Yep. As for you, <clears throat> take for yourselves some of all food which is edible and gather it to yourself and you shall be food and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had mm -hmm. commanded him. Yeah. What an obedient man. Mm -hmm. yeah. What an amazingly obedient yeah. man. Yeah. He was told what to do and he yeah. did it. He was told what to do and he did it. I love it. I love it. It tells us in Hebrews, in Hebrews um, 11, in Hebrews 11, I think it's Hebrews 11, 5. I lo it, in fact, Enoch and Noah are, are put together. It's so nice. It says in Hebrews 11:5, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death and he was not found because God took him up for he obtained the witness that before uh, his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. He was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Yes. People seek God. Yes. There are people in this world that seek him. They seek him for many reasons. I believe people are born, it says in Ecclesiastes, that with eternity in their heart, they know something. Yes. It says in Romans 1 that men are without excuse, even people that live on an island, yes. that they are without excuse, they seek him. It's, it says in is it Acts 17, he's nearer to you than you'll ever know. Yes. Um, they, there are men that seek him, but he says, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household. Yes. Now this is where we get the theological term soter soteriology from. Mm -hmm. Salvation. Salvation. So look mm -hmm. at what happens here. He hears the command of God to build an ark. And he's obedient. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. How is Noah and his family saved? Through the ark. They build the ark and through the ark, they're saved. They're not saved before then. They're not saved because God clicks his finger and suddenly they're saved. 
They're saved because they're obedient to God and they build an ark and they go in the ark. Yes. Now, what you see in the Old Testament is that they go into the ark. What you see in the New Testament is they go in Christ. Yes. In Christ. You see again and again and again in Paul's letters. We are in Christ. Yes. He is our ark. Yes. Okay, so we go back. We go back. Then you see something quite amazing. And it reminds me of my, the old days when I was first saved. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 7, he says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. Now, it's so graphic, this is. It's, in, it's absolutely amazing. Again and again and again, what you see in Genesis is this. All of the wicked, all of the wicked, all of the wicked, all of the wicked, all of them. Every wicked person is going to be drowned, blotted out, finished. But Noah, the righteous, are going to be saved, right? But all of the wicked, every one of them, will be blotted out. Now look at 1 Timothy 2, 3. One Timothy two three. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour. Go to six, verse six all the way through. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. It's an it's a phenomenal scripture. And twice, Paul tells Timothy that he desires all men to be saved. Yeah. Yeah. And then in verse yeah. 6, he says, who gave himself as a ransom for all. all. So we used to sing a hymn, all may live for Christ has died. Yes. Yes. All may live for Christ has died. So this is what we see. I hope you can see this because it's a mind blower. In the, in the days of Noah, the, the righteous live. The righteous live. But all of the unrighteous must die. All of them. At the first coming of the Messiah, the only righteous man that has ever really lived must die so that all might live. Do you see that? It's incredible. It's mind-blowing. It's, it's all we have. It's all we have. And if you take that away, you've got nothing. And I'm telling you, church, the attack is coming upon the gospel. You think... They, they botched the rainbow, right? You wait and see what they're going to do to the gospel. Yeah. Because you won't even recognize the gospel in the next 10 years. They will so botch this gospel that you will not even recognize it as the gospel anymore. And that's why we're looking at these things. Because I know, I've looked into these things enough. There's two things that are on the horizon when Islam comes in. There's the persecution that come with the Muslims, but there is the indoctrination of the Muslim faith that we have got this wrong. We've got the triunity wrong. We've got Jesus being the son wrong. And there's this massive indoctrination coming that our gospel is completely wrong. And so I'm telling you, and it will come again, and it's going to come wave after wave after wave. It's going to be like um, the sea smashing into a lighthouse again and again and again, trying to smash that thing down. People's minds are on all other things, but I'm telling you, the attack is coming upon the gospel. Yeah. And I will stand by the word of God. And I'm telling you this, a child can understand the gospel. Yeah. And if a child can't understand it, there's something fishy. Yeah. Yeah. 
If an 11 year old child can't understand the gospel and they're left thinking, I know, le- I know, now you've said that, I'm more confused than ever, there's something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Because the disciples didn't want the children to come to Jesus and Jesus said, don't you forbid the children to come to me for such is of the kingdom of God. Let them come to me because even a child can understand the gospel. And I can remember when I was 11 years of age, I'd never heard the gospel before in my life because in the Anglican church, they didn't give the gospel. But I went to a, a on, a, on, a, on a, one of these things that you go away and I can remember these teenagers older than me five or six years older than me, urgently giving the gospel. I'd never heard the gospel before in my life that God loved the world so much that he sent his only son to die in my place. I knew by then I was a sinner. That's what... It's what happens at the bar mitzvah. There comes a point when you know you're a sinner. There comes a point when you're old enough to know that you really need some way out of this because without that, you've had it. And so the gospel is that he sent his only son to die in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust, the rich for the poor, this incredible transaction that took place upon the cross so that all may live for Christ has died. That is the gospel. The gospel is not some crazy God before the time began Picking out, before time began, those that he thinks should go to heaven and those that he thinks should go to hell. Not because of anything they've done, but because he has already foreordained it. John Calvin quoted something called, doomed from the womb. Doomed from the womb. You know, there's a moral compass in every one of us that understands that a woman that takes the baby's life, it's morally wrong. You don't do that. You do not take your baby. But the woman says, it's my body. It's my right. It's my life. If I want this body to be ripped from limb to limb before it ever has a chance of even seeing the light of day and knowing good from evil, it's my body. I can do what I want. Well, this doctrine that God chooses people before the world began to damn the majority of them for his good pleasure. How can that ever be right? How can that be right? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God is love. In fact, it goes even further than that. It says God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. God did not create evil. God did not create sin. It says in Genesis that he regrets making man because these things had come in. Is God sovereign? Yes, he is sovereign. And there's things in the Bible that nobody has ever been able to explain fully. And if they say they can, they're a liar. People have argued about things for the past 400 years and here we are at the climax of the ages and we need to be focused on what really counts, the gospel. And I'll tell you folks, look, this is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. And if if, 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 if you cannot discern what's wrong with this stuff, You'll get swept in because the stuff that's coming is far harder to discern. But I can you see here, Jesus knew no sin and he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus said, Father, if it be thy will, he knew it was his will. He knew it was the Father's will. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Part of the Godhead, right there, part of the Godhead is saying, is there any other way? No, there is no other way. Jesus had to go to the cross. The righteous must die for the unrighteous. And we're all unrighteous. Jesus said, I came for sinners. We're all sinners. Let's go back to Genesis. 
Go back to Genesis. This is why this is so important that we understand this. Because there's a gospel message here. You've got to get into the ark. That's our part. The Lord will do the rest. He's so good. He's so loving. He will do the rest. But you've got to get into the ark. Mm. Let me tell you, friends, in my time, I have had some incredible divine appointments with people. Some phenomenal divine appointments with people. But it doesn't mean that because somebody's had a divine appointment that they are automatically going to get saved. They still have to make a decision. I remember going to Glencoe about two years ago. And I saw this guy in this van and I felt a nudge in my spirit. And I went over and I chickened out. I went over, I chatted to him about vans and everything, but I chickened out. So I came away and I felt the Holy Spirit say, go back. So I went back. I thought, I, I know, I'll talk about COVID. That will bring it around to the, and it did. It brought it around to God and he opened up to me. He says, well, actually, my dad's just died. And my dad was a pastor and my granddad was a, a missionary. And he says, I... I'm a devil, I'm a Satanist, I'm a Satanist. And he says, I cannot believe you've met me here today because he'd gone right down that path of Satanism, even though his dad was a pastor and his uh, granddad was a missionary. And I prayed for that man and he wept like a baby. But I'll tell you this. And he sent me through text saying, you, it's changed me, it's changed me. But you still have to make a decision. Yeah. I think it was Felix that says, Thou was almost persuaded me yeah. to yeah. become a Christian. Yeah. God can set up amazing divine appointments, but the ball is still <laughs> in your court. Yeah. 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 And it happens. I've seen it happen so many times. So many times. All may live, for Christ has died. This is the only thing that we have. Yeah. If you... If you minimize the love of God for his righteousness and his justice and his holiness because it doesn't suit what you believe, you end up with a God that doesn't love anymore. Mm. How can you go to somebody and say to them, hey, you know what? I want to tell you about Christianity. Oh, pray tell me. Well, what it is is this. There's a God in heaven that created everything. And before you were even born, he's chosen whether you're going to go to heaven or hell or not. No, they're going to, they're going to think you're a moron. But if you go to them and say, the Bible says that God loves you and he sent his son into this world to die for your sins. At least it makes sense. Now, let's. Go from verse 2. Verse 2. Genesis verse 2. All the way to verse 16. Somebody want to read that? <clears throat> you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days will I cause it to rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. 
On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them, entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark of to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord closed the door exactly when the floods began. On the very same day that the floods began, God closed the door. That door was open. That door was open for a long time. And they were going in and out and probably making all kinds of <laughs> arrangements. You can only imagine how much organization went in. Yeah. Yeah. That door was only shut when the wrath of God came. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. Yeah. It also has to do with the timing of the rapture. There is no gap. There is no gap between when they go in the wrath of God comes immediately. There's no gap. You see the same thing with Lot. When Lot leaves, the wrath falls. You see the same thing in Jericho. When, when Rahab leaves, the wrath comes. There's, there's no gap between them. There's no like period of three and a half years or seven years or whatever. As soon as the righteous are taken, God pours out his wrath and yeah. punishment, undiluted. It's the wrath. We have not been appointed to wrath. That's what we looked at last week. Orge, the word in the Greek is orge. We have not been appointed to wrath. So that's what we see here. But the door isn't shut until the wrath comes. Yeah. There's going to come a point when we are totally secure. When Jesus takes us, that door is shut yeah. and we're yeah. saved forever. We're secure forever. Yeah. Nothing will ever change anything. We will be with him forever. Yeah. But that door shuts when the wrath yeah. comes. Yeah. There is an opportunity for our family and our friends. Mm. Yeah. And the opportunity is there because we serve a loving God. Yes. And he's a patient God. Yeah. And I said this on Sunday morning. The very, the very heart of everything that he is, is the mercy seat. Yes. Yeah. It's the mercy seat. Mercy. Yes, yeah. nobody's denying that God is holy. Of course he's holy. Nobody's denying that he's righteous. Of course he's righteous. He has all these attributes, but his heart is mercy. Mm -hmm. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us his heart is mercy and if there was ever a time we need mercy it's now mm. this world is going crazy yeah. 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 now I just want to look at some doors just in, in closing if you want to look at Matthew chapter 25 verse 10 Matthew chapter 25 verse 10 and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And the next verse, Keith. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Therefore, no. therefore, you yes, know sir. neither the day nor the hour mm. wherein the Son of Man cometh. You see how these virgins desperately want the door to be open, but it's shut now. It's shut now. Now, you may or may not know this. When at the timing that Jesus was giving these parables to the disciples, which is Passover time, Songs of Solomon was being read in the temple, right? And this is exactly what they would be reading in the temple. I'll show you. It's in Songs of Solomon, chapter 5. 
I'll read this to you. Songs of Solomon 5 verse 2. I sleep, but my heart is awake. Remember the virgins? Yeah. Right? I sleep, but my heart is awake. So as Jesus was reading this, uh, sorry, was teaching the disciples this. This is what was being read in the temple. A voice, my beloved, was knocking. Open to me. Open to me, my sister and my darling. This is God wanting to have communion with them. Mm -hmm. This is not a God that controls everything. These people are not robots. He's wanting communion with them. My dove, my perfect one, for my head is drenched with dew. My locks with the damp of the night. She says, I've taken off my dress. Well, that speaks of the robes of salvation. Yes. I've taken off my dress. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. She's taken off the shoes of the gospel. I've, ta I've taken out. How can I be dirty again? My beloved extended his hand through the opening. He still wants this koinonia with her. Yes. He wants it. He's not willing for anyone to perish. And my feelings were aroused for him. I aroused, to, I aroused to open for my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bowl. And I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had gone. It was too late. He wanted, he wanted fellowship with her. I want you to open for me. She says, it's not the right time for me. This is, I'll come back at a more convenient time. But that more convenient time went. Yeah. And basically she gets beaten up after this by the watchman. It's a picture of tribulation. But if you go to Revelation, if you go to Revelation, you know where I'm going here. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Everybody knows. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. Somebody want to read that? Revelation 3, 20 to 22. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Carry on, Ray. Oh, sorry. Up to the end of that. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To all seven churches, Jesus says, you must overcome. You must overcome. Yeah. And the overcomer is granted a reward. The one that doesn't overcome is not granted anything, yeah. nothing. Mm. So in, at the end of Revelation, it says, the one who overcomes shall in, uh, inherit all yeah. things, everything, yeah. but we must overcome. Yeah. When you look in the scriptures and you're being really honest, just really honest, you can see the sovereignty of God and you can see the free will of man mm. playing out together yeah. from Genesis to revelation yeah. they play out together and we have to cooperate with our god yeah. we have to do that now then it says in genesis revelation 4 it says after these things i looked and behold a door was standing open in heaven one day that door's going to yeah, show yeah. Yeah. one day it's going to show yeah. but it's open right now and it's yeah. open for all yeah it's open for whosoever. It's open for everyone. The word whosoever can be translated all or everyone. It's pass. The word is pass in the Greek. Whosoever, all, everyone. It means the same thing. It means everyone, whoever. Now, there's, this Bible is littered with this from one end to the other. It's littered. So when you look at our family and our friends, they can accept Christ. Yeah. While there's time. When I look at Adam, I can see the conviction of God. I remember Alan coming out of that office there because he'd seen a Bible that he had when he was a little child. And it was a divine appointment that Miriam set up, but the Bible wasn't set up. It just so happened to be there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Alan's going to get saved. 
I'm telling you, I have had countless divine appointments that would blow, that are mind blowing, mind blowing. But a person has to accept Christ. Now, let's just continue on and we'll come to a conclusion. It's only a short session. But in Matthew chapter 23, there's a terrible storm coming in AD 70, right? You all know what happens in AD 70 is so severe that women fight over the afterbirth of their babies because they, they have been, the Romans have laid siege on Jerusalem there isn't enough trees. Remember the trees that bear fruit? Well, yeah. they took the lot down. They always yeah. do. There wasn't enough trees to crucify the amount of people that there were. They starved them out. It, what they did to the Jews at that time was unbelievably cruel, right? So he comes to them in Matthew 23, verse 70, 37. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I, this is Jesus speaking, yeah. Yeah. but he's clearly saying, I, I'm God here. I'm God all the way through the ages. I have wanted to gather you, to gather you, to gather your children together. The way a, a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. In other words, what the ark does for Noah is what he wants to do for them. Come under me. Come under my protection. Yeah. Come under my refuge. Yeah. Come into the ark. Yeah. And the ark is a type of Christ. Yes. You know, you can have a plane that it's been in the computers, let's say, for a whole year, that that plane is predestined to leave London and to go to New York, right? That's what's going to happen. It's going to go. The plane is predestined to go. But you have to get on that plane to, to, go, on that, to, mm. to go on that journey. You must go in. Yeah. You must believe in the Lord first. Yeah. You get into the plane, you go on the journey. Yeah. And that's how it is. Yeah. That's how it is. These people would not come to Jesus. He says you were unwilling. You are, he says, I wanted you to come. This is God speaking. I willed you. I wanted you to come. But you would not come. Yeah. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah. And then he says, behold, your house is left to you desolate. Mm. Have a look at Romans. The Romans. We'll read this very quickly. Romans 10. Romans 10, 9. Listen. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yeah. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Listen very carefully. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Yeah. Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. I can... I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I can remember reasoning with God as an unsafe person. I can remember reasoning. If the gospel is for everyone, then that includes me. Yeah. I can remember having reasoning now with God in the attic on a Sunday with four cans of skull. <laughs> if the gospel is for everyone, then that includes me. That must be for me as well because I'm part of everyone. Yeah. And then, because that, the way my mind works, the next thing that came is it's too simple. It's too simple. This gospel is too simple. Then something else came. What if it's supposed to be simple? <coughs> what if that's the way it's supposed to be? <laughs> for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is the Lord of all. all. Abounding in riches for all who call on him. For Whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? This is why we have to share the gospel with people. 
How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of him that brings good news of good tidings. However, they did not all believe or heed the good news. It's good news. Yeah. It's good yeah. news. The, the other day, I heard a, a somebody that was a, a, what you call a hyper-Calvinist that had been a Calvinist for years and years and years that had suddenly realised, and this is what they said, Listen to this, they said, the gospel is good news after all. The gospel is good news after all. Because if it's true, the gospel isn't good news to the vast majority of people because they don't stand a chance. Because they've been predetermined to go to hell. Yeah. And this pastor that had been a, a hyper-Calvinist for all this time just has suddenly has this moment where he says, oh, the gospel is good news after all. Yeah. Oh God, yeah, it's terrible, it's terrible. What in God's name are we doing with the gospel? Yeah, 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 yes. However, they do not all have the good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth. To the, uh, their words to the end of the earth. Paul said to the, to, the, to the unbelievers, the reprobate in Romans 1, they don't have an excuse. They have no excuse. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold. I love how Jesus said that because that proves to us that the Bible is not just written by God, it's written by man. It is God and man combined together. Yeah. Isaiah was very bold when he said, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Talking about the Gentiles, okay? But for Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. It was my will to save them. Yeah. I chose them. They were my chosen people, but they wouldn't choose me. However, there were those. And you see a point in, in the book of Acts where Paul says, I'm going to the Gentiles and they will believe. And so what you see in the book of Acts are Gentiles that the Bible calls God-fearing people. Yeah. They are people that don't yet believe, but they, they have this reverence for God. Mm -hmm. They don't yet believe, they're not born again and they've never heard the gospel. None of those things. And so the one of them is called Cornelius. Yes. And so there's this, um, what was Cornelius? A centurion, yes. a man of authority that feared God, that Peter is sent. The angel can't give him the gospel. Peter is sent to Cornelius, who was a God-fearer, who was seeking out God. Yeah. He was already seeking out God. And he sends the gospel to him. He sends the gospel to him. He wasn't this reprobate person that would never be able to understand. There are people that are seeking out God. Yes. There was another one by the name of the Ethiopian eunuch and he's coming yeah. away and, and he's, he's seeking out God. The Apostle Paul was seeking out God. Saul of Tarsus was seeking out God. He really believed he was doing God a favour. He really did believe he was. A Pharisee of Pharisees he was. He loved God. He just had God wrong. And so you see with um, Philip is sent to somebody that was seeking God out. And just as he's reading... He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Just as he's pulling alongside his reading, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And he says, well, who is he talking about? Who is this person? I'm seeking him out. I've never heard the gospel in my life, ever. But I want to know who this person is. And he's sent to him. 
He sent to me, you go to him, you go to him, you go over to that one, go and tell Felix, go and tell that there, but you still have to believe. So, so the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch says, what must I do, you know, in order that I might be baptised? And Philip says, only believe. Yeah. Believe. Yeah. Believe. Now, the, there's two versions. One version of the Bible is older than the other. One says, <coughs> believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And the other says, only believe. Yeah. Depending on the, the, the manuscripts that you use. But do you see this, friends? Do you see this? This is so important. Because I'm telling you now, once you go down the route of the character of God being totally unpredictable, like a Russian roulette, What's in this? Is there a bullet in that chamber or am I going to be okay? Am I going to be saved or not? Spin the barrel, let's see what happens. What's God ordained in that barrel for that person? This is what John Wesley said about that. John Wesley said it was a blasphemous teaching that made God out to be a liar and made God out to be worse than Satan himself. Now, is, it was John Wesley worth listening to? Yeah. Well, he did 250,000 miles on horseback. He preached 40,000 sermons. He stopped the French Revolution from coming over to this country. He helped to, 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 he helped to abolish the slave trade. He saw thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people saved and discipled. Yes. And that's what he thought about the idea that God is the one that selects before time began People to go to hell and people to go to heaven. That's what Wesley thought about it. Now this is what it says in Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 verse 30. <coughs> Therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance, Jesus has died now. God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere must repent. All people everywhere must repent. Because the gospel is for all. Now let me come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. This is it. And John, just turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. In John chapter 14 verse 16. Mm -hmm. I will ask the Father. And he will give you the helper. Yeah. Yeah. That he may be with you forever. Yeah. That is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. Why are we looking at this study, church? We're not looking at this study to try and prove who's more spiritual than the next person. We're looking at this study because it's a survival guide for the last days. Because things are coming in rapidly now. Rapidly. And you need to know that if you are truly born again, God has given you the spirit of of truth and a child can understand the gospel yeah. a child can understand the mm. gospel now when i was a young christian i didn't know the bible very well i'm not claiming to know the bible that well today either but i didn't and there was a man that came to me and he said to me you, you know, you're doing really well. You're going on really well, he says. But I've got this binder full of magazines that he paid a lot of money for. Very expensive magazines. He says, this will practically, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, this will take you to the next level. You know. So he says, take these home with you. Very expensive magazines. So I take <coughs> these magazines home and I had not got a clue who Kenneth Copeland was or Kenneth Hagen. Not a clue. I'd never heard of him. So I, I, I read through these magazines as a Christian that hardly knew his Bible, but I had the Spirit of God. Yes. And I read, I read them, and I knew after two pages that it wasn't for me. Yes. It's just, it was just not for me. Yeah. And I, I met this person again. He said, how oh, did you get on? How oh, did you get on? I said, it's not for me. I don't need that. You know, He wasn't happy, but I knew. Because... Friends, when the spirit of truth is in you, yeah. you can smell when something's not right. Yes. You can yeah. smell it when it's not right. Mm -hmm. 
instinctively you know. So that, that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it did not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you. Remember the dimensions of the ark, 350 and 30. Yes. 300 is Gideon's army. 50 is the spirit of God yes. and 30 is maturity. Yes. Go, go over to um, verse 26. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and he will bring it to remembrance. Listen to me. That listen. Did Jesus ever say that you need a, you need a degree in theology to be able to be a discerning Christian? Did he ever say that? Did he ever say that you need a doctorate in theology in order to understand the Bible? Did he ever say that? Did he ever say that you need to understand Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew to understand the Bible? No, he never said that. And you see this Bible that we have here, friends. You see all these words in this Bible, whether it's Hebrew, Aramaic or Greek. Do you know that this has been translated by some of the best uh, um, linguists that the world has ever known. That's all they've ever done. And what we have here, thank God, broadly speaking, is, is something that's pretty accurate. We have it. What did Jesus say we need? Did he say we need... No, Be believe this or not, and I'm not bragging, this has just happened. I ended up on the board of a Bible college. <laughs> on a board. All the others had doctorates. They knew he Hebrew and Greek, all sorts. I don't know Hebrew, Greek. I, don't, I haven't got doctorates. I ended up on the board of a Bible car. I asked the guy, why, the principal, why, have you, why did you want me on here? He says, I just need you on here. And I know what it was. I understand. I, un I understood what my place was on it too. You see, when Peter and John... Uh, stood before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin said, we know that they have been with Jesus. Yeah. 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 And, and you see these here? This tells me that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth and that he will teach you. Yes. Let me tell you this. If you took this Bible, right, and you drop this Bible on an uninhabited island in the middle of nowhere and you dropped it down, and let's say there's a population on this island of 20,000 people that had never heard the gospel and knew nothing about history. And the elders of that place gradually came to know the Lord. If you went back there in 10 years' time, I can absolutely guarantee you that they would not come up with half of the crazy things that we have today, these crazy templates today, whether it be extreme Arminianism or extreme Calvinism, whether it be the tulip or the opposite to the tulip, they would not come up with that stuff because the only reason why we ended up with that stuff is an overreaction to Catholicism in the Middle Ages. That's how we ended up with it. Jesus has given us the spirit of truth and he's given us the word and I believe it's all we need. I'm not yeah. saying that there's not a place for scholars. Thank God for scholars. Thank God for people that do that. But never ever fall into the trap of knowledge is the key to power. Never fall into that trap. I believe that a true Christian that is truly saved and has the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, you can smell it when it's wrong. One of the gifts of the spirit is discernment. Yes. Yeah. It's discernment. Yeah. When you look at the ark and Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, it will be. What on earth enticed all of those women to do what they did? I'll tell you what, deception. Yeah. Deception. Jesus, what's the sign of your coming? Deception, 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 deception. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Make sure that you're not deceived. Make sure that it's not, this letter is not coming from us and you need to know this letter is not coming from us. The, the four horses of the apocalypse, deception. Deception, deception, deception. 
we're going into a time where if we were playing that game, is it called Jaeger? Yes. Is it called Jaeger with the blocks? Jenga, Jenga, sorry. The, the, bottom, the bottom blocks are the gospel. They're not interested in the top of the tower. They're going straight for the foundations now. Mm -hmm. They're going straight for the gospel itself. And we have to know. Amen. We're going to be looking at all the aspects of Jesus in the armour of God. That's what we're going to be looking at. It might seem blatantly and stupidly simple. But it's going to be more important to us, I believe, yeah. that we understand not just here, here, yeah. in the spirit, in our spirit. This is the gospel. And without the gospel, we are nothing. We're nothing. Without the love of God, without the mercy seat, we are nothing. We've got nothing to offer anyone. But with the gospel, well, they conquered the Roman Empire. Amen. I wonder if we could just pray. I think specifically, because uh, I didn't know about that Scottish law. I think we really need to pray about that. Pray for one another. If it's in Scotland, is it going to come over here? How on earth are they going to vet that? Let's just finish off, friends, and let's just pray. Bring these things before the Lord. And of course... <coughs> Let's pray for Israel. I found out, by the way, that there's, a, there's a, 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 a huge prayer meeting happening for the hostages. And guess what they, they're doing? They're repenting. Oh, oh, they're right. repenting. Oh, by the wailing wall. By the wailing wall. Hallelujah. They're That's repenting. The Lord. Yeah. Lord. Yeah, yeah. 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 Amazing. Let's just finish off in prayer, friends. Just feel free to pray. Lord, we do thank you that we can come, Lord, tonight and we can, Lord, <coughs> gather together and have fellowship with one another yes. and with you. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we know that you are the sovereign Lord of the universe, that, uh, Lord, you uh, open up the future to us, Lord, who are called by your name and uh, look into your word. And Father, we just pray for this, this world, Lord, in which we live at this particular time. Lord, we pray for politicians in, in powerful places and have... Um, powerful words if you like mm. Father God mm. we just pray in Jesus name Lord that Lord they will also have your wisdom Father we pray that Lord though mm. these laws uh, come into being uh, Father we pray that they will realise that they're just completely unworkable mm. and that these things uh, are foolish Father, we pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that we shall be uh, discerning in these last days. We pray, Lord, that we shall be uh, people, Lord, of your word and of your spirit. And that, Lord, we may be able to offer up, Lord, uh, uh, reproof, if you like, of, of those things that come against us, those questions that are... Are, 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 are given to us, Lord, that we might have an answer for all who ask us about the salvation of Jesus Christ. Father, we just pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you'll be with us and help us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, continually. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Direct us, Lord, by your word. Uh, Lord, help us. We are a needful people. Yes, we are. Help us. Hallelujah. 
Lord, I just thank you for this meeting, Lord. And Lord, that the meeting that they're going to have at the Western Wall. And Lord, I just pray that you protect the people, Lord, as they pray and repent, Lord, that your spirit will dwell on them, Lord. And Lord, that the Lord make out for us with our friends and our families. That we might share, Lord, what we know with them, Lord. Lord, that they might turn to you, Lord, before the door is closed. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Oh, Lord, I just thank you for the privilege of coming to these meetings, Lord. I thank you for Tim and Mandy, Lord, and I pray that you will protect them, Lord Jesus, and, and this fellowship, Lord, and this little church, Lord, and Lord, that your word will keep going out and keep spreading over all the world, Lord, as people join in, join in the meeting in, in the YouTube, or, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you will Bless everything that goes on here, Lord, and mm. your protection. Jesus. Honest, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Mm. Mm. <coughs> Father, I thank you that we've already decided who we believe. Mm. Yeah. And we're not going to succumb to the opinions of those, Lord, who would suppress us because we don't accept what they believe. Lord, we stand by your word in faith, believing, trusting you, Lord, to the end of our days, knowing that we are set apart and are encouraged, Lord, to help others join us, Lord, to be part of your flock and not the oppressor. We know his destination, Lord, we have no desire to be with him. Lord, I ask for your protection for this building, for everyone who comes into it, and for all in this nation, Lord, who trust and believe in you. For those who have entered into our world of freedom, Lord, with the intention to suppress us, Lord, and to destroy us. Lord, we give them no due. We give them no affirmation, for we know whence their heart is taking them. And we've no desire to be with them, Lord, but to follow you into the eternal throne of the Father's house. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.